Uh, Lucy Winkett is a very different preacher to Otis Moss III, and a very different preacher to Steve Chalk. But the kind of preacher Lucy is, is the best in the business. And when you've heard Lucy, you just want to hear again, and again, and again. And we get to do that today, and I'm absolutely thrilled that Lucy completes the, the quartet and is going to be our final preacher today. Thanks for being with us. feel obliged now to say that I don't listen to anybody on Thought for the Day, <laughs> except Sam Wells, <laughs> which has the virtue of also being true. Thank you so much for um, including me in your day, your festival of preaching. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about preaching. I've been preaching for some years now, um, almost three decades. And I've been thinking a lot in the last 12 months, actually, about preaching. And I realized that when I was preparing for this. I thought, well, what am I going to say? Because, you know, many of us in this room, we preach regularly. How do we find something else to say? Um, but I realized that, actually, over the last 12 months, and may, maybe 24 months, but especially the last 12 months, I've found preaching hard. And I think it's getting harder. So I wanted to sort of interrogate that a little bit and say why I thought that was the case. Because I thought preaching through a pandemic was difficult, not least all the technological challenges, but to a, to a, a, a bruised and bewildered uh, audience, congregation, who I couldn't see, um, that was an extremely difficult challenge. But I, I sort of feel like it's getting, it's getting harder and harder as we go into a whole set of circumstances, which I'll say a little bit about in my prepared talk, because it's a, it's a combination of challenges, it seems to me, that we're speaking into. There are systemic challenges, political, global, and then there are obviously pastoral individual challenges, the cost of living, uh, mental health challenges of individuals. And I find myself thinking, now we're all back IRL, in real life, now we're all back um, in person. I find myself thinking sometimes as I look around the church and I try to remember to look at the camera as well, um, that John the Baptist question, what is it that you've come out to see? What is it that you want? And more importantly, what is it that you need on this day, on this Sunday, after the week that you've had, after the year that you're having, after the life that you're living? So these last 12 months, I've been living with a preacher in my head who is a preacher from the 18th century who has been around at St. James Piccadilly for nearly all the time that the church has been there. But his story and his voice and his words have been submerged for all the reasons that you might expect when I tell you that the preacher is Kuobna Otoba Kuguano. And this is his sermon. It's a book published in 1787, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil of Slavery. And I'll say a little bit about him as I go through. But this last month, in fact, the last two months, we have been marking the 250th anniversary of the baptism of Quobna in our church, in St. James's Church, which happened on the 20th of August in 1773. And... Part of the reason that we have made such a, uh, a moment of this as a church is that there is no other date and place that is ascribable to this really important figure and important preacher. There's no other date that's ascribable to him than the day that he stood at the font in St. James's in 1773 and was baptized as a 16-year-old young man. There's no gravestone for him. Nobody knows where or when he died. There is no date of his birth, and there's no date of his marriage, although we assume perhaps he did get married. And so it's been our duty, as we have seen it, and, uh, and our honour 
to carve his name into the walls of the church at St. James's, knowing that there is no other place that his name is written and there is no other place that his name is carved in either Ghana, where he was born, or Grenada, where he was enslaved, or in London, where he lived and was freed and was baptized. So I've been carrying his sermon around with me probably for the last 12 months leading up to this moment of August 2023, remembering August 1773. And I want to speak a little bit um, and weave perhaps his method of preaching, because it's a very distinctive method, into what I want to say today. Because what I've found is that his approach to preaching, his use of scripture, and his interrogation of the society in which he lived, and his, frankly, his courage and the audacity of his rebuke of the society in which he lives is really uh, instructive and makes preaching even harder than I thought it was. Every day I say morning prayer not far from the font where William Blake was baptised, but at that same font, as I mentioned, Born in the same year, we think, as William Blake, came a 16-year-old young man in 1773 to be baptized. Kuobna Otoba Kuguano was kidnapped as a child, as he says in his book, while he was playing with his friends in a West African village he grew up in. He was trafficked to Grenada in a slave ship, enslaved on a plantation, bought by an Englishman, taken to London, and then freed. And the first thing he did on obtaining his freedom was, as he says, on the advice of some good people to seek baptism in order that he would never be carried away again. He was a parishioner at St. James's Piccadilly, living in Pall Mall, working in the household of Richard and Maria Cosway. And it was while living there and worshipping at St. James's that he wrote this book, this sermon, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil of Slavery, which is important not least because it's the first book by an enslaved person of African descent to call for the total abolition of slavery everywhere, for everyone, forever. Kuguano and Blake were both preachers of sorts, although perhaps not in the conventional sense. Neither would have been permitted in the pulpit at St. James's physically, but their writing, speaking, letter writing, and campaigning was an expression, often in opposition to contemporary church te teaching, of the fundamental call on Christians rooted in their baptism promises to renounce evil. Preachers promise to preach the gospel in and out of season, especially perhaps when things are difficult, compromised, contested, or unclear. And in today's soundbite culture, where the strongest messages have to be Instagrammable, it's a strange thing to do, honestly, to speak uninterrupted, well, usually uninterrupted, in a public setting where anyone can walk in or walk out, and to do this week after week. Within contemporary British society, it's really important for any of us who preach to remember that preaching a sermon is frankly weird. And preaching has, in popular culture, of course, pejorative tones, implying a judgmental attitude and a demeanor best described as holier than thou. That has one exception in the drag community, where preach is an empowering word. But for most, preach implies a sense of judgment and standing apart and looking down one's nose. And so in the manner of Kuguano and Blake and many since, I suppose I don't want to lose the shock of the opportunity of being able to preach regularly. An overused word, it is honestly, of course, a privilege. And we can't take that for granted. Over the years that I've been preaching, from small Methodist chapels of the Midlands to Anglican cathedrals to gatherings on the street, at gravesides, any number of other settings like you, I've often wondered, how can I stay close to the edge? How can I stay close to the truth? How can I keep looking for fresh perspectives? How can I remain attentive to the spirit who blows where she wills? <laughs> 
and not attempt to capture, domesticate, weaken, as if anyone ever could, the clarifying, connecting, and enlivening spirit that is abroad in the world. My job as a preacher is just to catch that spirit and to get out of her way. The convention of how to preach, particularly, I guess, in an Anglican church, doesn't really help this. In conventional sermons, one person speaks, and while they speak, other people are listening, like now. Even in a sermon that has a measure of participation or call and response or element of discussion, it's still the case that one preacher has crafted what's often called the sermon slot to be what it is. So this, doesn't it, gives power to the one who speaks. Yes, but the opposite reality is true too. For any preacher who's speaking from within a community, such as a church congregation, the sermon is never created in isolation. It's a collective endeavor, as the meaning of scripture broken open for that community at that time. What's more, whenever one speaks and others listen, of course it's true that the person speaking holds power, but other sorts of power are being exercised too, like now. The power of the preacher is really an illusion. There are thoughts and feelings that the congregation experience in the exchange that the preacher couldn't control if they wanted to and will almost certainly never know. And a preacher throws themselves on the mercy of the congregation because especially over time, there are things about the preacher that the congregation will learn that the preacher themselves may never discover. A preacher is never able to be aware of all our biases, prejudices, and hypocrisies. Despite our best efforts to find them all and name them all, they are resolutely hidden from us. They can often be seen by others and of course are seen by God. But the hypocrisies and prejudices of the preacher are there for all to see. To be honest, whether or not I were a preacher, it is in part my growing awareness of this as a human being and as a Christian, which takes me to church and by and large keeps me there. To follow Christ as a preacher of the word, to commit to my practice of religion with others, precisely because I know my need of God's mercy as a speaker. Because I live in the gap between the person I am and the person that I want to be. And I reveal that every time I speak. Because I recognize St. Paul's flesh and long for Christ's spirit, because there are times when I have sat in the valley of the dry bones of my life and begged them to remember how to dance. Divine mercy is the context for the exchange between preacher and congregation. Divine mercy sets the horizon and the boundaries within which preacher and congregation are asked continually to forgive one another. And by doing so, we build Christian community, authentic Christian community, together. In contemporary culture, every day, congregations and preachers are bombarded by images, invitations to buy stuff, persuasive copy of every kind, created by every comms strategy of every institution, political party, church, business, and charity. And for preachers, context is everything. So in the 2020s, preaching has to take into account this daily bombardment of words, information, images, and stories. Like the Gospels, sermons are, to use the theological word, kerygmatic. That is, they're not just text recounting facts, doctrine, or lists. They're telling stories, constructing arguments, building a case that invites responses from the congregation. Sermons are written to persuade others of something. To take the example of Kuobna Otoba Kuguanu, his kerygmatic text takes the form of a sermon, yes, and a particular form at that, 
It's a Jeremiad in the manner of the prophet Jeremiah. A mixture of personal testimony, powerful rhetoric, rooted in scripture and Christian doctrine. Kuguano's courage as a preacher is breathtaking because he was attending church services in a congregation that included parishioners who funded his abolitionist tract. 168 of them are listed in the text. And they were clearly strongly supportive. But alongside them, he sat in those pews with people who were clearly and verifiably benefiting from the transatlantic slave trade and who received compensation on the abolition of the trade for the slaves that, slaves that they'd owned. To issue such a scriptural rebuke to them in his written sermon is astonishing, given his own experience of being enslaved. Someone who is in our congregation said recently, can you imagine going to church the Sunday after that book was published? Kugawano preaches equality and freedom for all people everywhere forever, based in the doctrine of creation found in Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve. He is simply and clearly uncompromising, saying that if any person believes it's acceptable to own another person, then they simply cannot be Christian. He takes on the racist ideologies and theologies that were espoused by Christian and church slave owners who argued an inherent inequality based on skin color from an interpretation of the story of Cain and Abel that led to the mark of Cain. He reinterprets that theology and says clearly that the mark of Cain as the brother who killed his brother inviting condemnation does exist but it's on the slave owners, not the slaves. Therefore, it's conditional about behavior, not genetics. The key principle for his preaching is that it is scriptural, personal, political, and visionary. If ever preachers in local communities were needed with these characteristics, I want to suggest it's now. The task of the preacher is surely not to be controversial for the sake of it, of course not, or anxious about how creative or political or erudite or relevant they are. The task of the preacher, and you can hear it in every word Kuguano says, the task of the preacher is simply re to return to the source of all being in scripture and in prayer, the presence of God, there, we will know more what to say. The presence of God, which is the most creative, generative presence in which all preachers live and move and have our being. So the task for preachers is not to try to think of something better to say, but to return to the source of all that creativity in the first place. Like Kuguano also, preachers preach as baptized people from the standpoint of someone immersed in that baptismal identity. And the promises taken at my baptism are the foundational promises of a preacher. I turn to Christ. I repent of my sins. I renounce evil. And over years of returning to the source of life, studying the scripture, reading the newspaper, living the ministerial life, this is in itself a sort of continual baptism, returning to the heart of things, making promises while you're there. It's a sort of continual baptismal process, spiritual drowning and death, moving into new energy and life. Because over years of preaching, and I guess some of you might recognize this, it's so easy to become stale, uninterested, or worn into a groove. Oh, yes, that parable. I know what I think about that one. Oh, yes, of course, it's ascension. I'm not sure I'm feeling it this year, but I'll dig out what I said before and see if I can adapt it. Oh, yes, Mary Magdalene. Well, I've done my revisionist sermon on the fact that she wasn't actually a prostitute. I'm not really sure what else there is to say. In our quest for freshness, 
we can become too blown by the wind of current events, forever changing, of course. Or, by contrast, we can become so exhausted by the pace of current events to the extent that we retreat into a more risk-averse reliance on what's worked in the past. That, in reality, is more brittle than stable. This can manifest itself over time in a reluctance in a preacher to try new approaches, to let go of the script, or to write a script, or find different interpreters, or make a different path. And there are always the voices that call preachers to account, reminding us that we take a risk every time we dare to approach this task. Otoba Kuguano seems certainly to have had his fill of preachers who were given license to speak in public by the church. This is something that he wrote. Sometimes an old woman selling matches will preach a better and more orthodox sermon than some of the clergy, who are only decked out with the external trappings of religion. Much of the great wickedness of others lieth at their door, and these words of the prophet are applicable to them. And first, saith the Lord, I will recommence their, recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. Such are the errors of men. Church signifies an assembly of people, but a building of wood, brick, or stone where the people meet together is generally called so, and should the people be frightened away by the many abominable dead carcasses which they meet with there, they should follow the multitudes to the fields, to the valleys, to the mountains, to the islands, to the rivers and to the ships, and compel them to come in, that the house of the Lord may be filled The novelist Iris Murdoch wrote back in, the in 1970 that Christianity is not so much abandoned as unknown. Even more true now than then. Of the people alive today, more generations have grown up without reference to Christian assumptions and teachings than have. The contemporary theologians John Baptist Metz and Rowan Williams, amongst others, talk of cultural amnesia and cultural bereavement. Preachers preach in today's society and church, preaching to congregations who are themselves aware of and facing huge existential challenges of climate change, the forced migration of people, the inevitability of more pandemics, and the instability of international relations in the context of weakening multinational organizations such as the UN. The necessary calls for justice following the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements. A greater appreciation of the divergent identities of human beings with regard to gender, neurology, disability, to name just three current issues, also cause existential reflection on the nature of humanity, our interdependence with the earth, and the increasing knowledge we have of the variety of the people God has made. And layered onto those global challenges will be the local, the contingent, the community-focused day-to-day realities that a preacher speaks into with the energy and freshness of good news. As I've reflected on the sermon a little of Otoba Kuguano, his Jeremiah, it seems to me that the theology from this former enslaved person speaks directly into the huge themes that we face today. Preaching in our context in 2023 demands a combination of challenge to contemporary injustice with an insistence on the goodness and mercy of God. This sort of preaching reveals what I want to suggest is a hard-edged hope that addresses our hearers, as he did, as perpetrators, not just as victims. And in that combination is a manifesto for 21st century preaching. To confront contemporary injustices as honestly as we can, 
while relying utterly on the goodness and mercy of God. And vitally understanding that these sermons are preached in a society where none of these themes can find ready understanding or acceptance. In a world full of echo chambers and reinforcing beliefs, the ability to preach about difficult subjects in a merciful way is more necessary now than ever where Christianity is not so much abandoned as unknown. Ottobar Kuguano's language is of the 18th century. His sentences can be very long. But his theological clarity is necessary for the 21st. And this brings me to my final reflection for today's preachers. Kuguano was challenging the great evil of his day, the transatlantic chattel slave trade. He was doing this from within his own experience of that trade. And in the context of a church that owned and trafficked slaves themselves. But his sort of preaching gives me, perhaps gives us, a blueprint for preaching into today's huge challenges. He insisted on vengeance and judgment being a necessary consequence for unrepentant slave traders. But he also insisted that it wasn't his role to exact any of that as a human being. That task belonged to God. And that God would exercise that judgment with mercy. Like the psalmists, Kuguano's preaching did not ask God to provide him with the means and opportunity to exact vengeance, but revealed the pain and injustice of the world at the same time as throwing all of this responsibility upon God to call it to account and receive the repentance of the perpetrators. Perhaps this is that hard-edged hope, the good news of redemption that comes with authentic repentance and restoration the strength and courage that characterizes his rebuke is breathtaking given his contemporary context of both church and society. And for 21st century Christians, no longer familiar with the operation of God's judgment with mercy, it is, of course, a bracing message, but one that lands heavily in the debates about climate change, systemic injustice, persistent prejudice and inequality. To preach the judgment and mercy of God has become controversial and difficult to do, not least because God's mercy addresses us as hearers at the point of our power to act as potential perpetrators and our capacity for mistakes or betrayal, to use the theological word sin, not only do we not really want to be addressed in this way, for that way lies accountability and potential exposure, but in the 21st century, we understand a lot more about the psychological strands that operate together that make us even more reluctant to be addressed by a merciful God. Because not only are we addressed as people with power to act, but we're also addressed as people in need, both powerful and needy. It's hard to reconcile ourselves with either of those. And when those two attributes operate together, we discover our own identity not as victims, which is morally preferable, easier to inhabit, but as potential or actual perpetrators, the things we have done and the things we have left undone. It's a brave preacher who can really unpack these themes from the gospel without lapsing into judgmental assumptions or trespassing into territory that hurts more than heals the divisions we live with. Contemplating the mercy of God brings us into close proximity with our power, our need, and our sin. Otherwise, the mercy wouldn't be needed in the first place. Rowan Williams paints a vivid picture. Where we are 
and who we are is the furnace where the Son of God walks. In this poetic picture, where we are and who we are is the furnace where the Son of God walks, is a picture that captures somehow the paradox of mercy and truth-telling that I've heard in the preaching of this particular preacher, Kugawano, and the paradox I'm trying to reach for. It's not only when I'm at my most powerful that the presence of mercy is required, but when I am at my most intimate, when I experience mercy being shown towards me, it's a choking relief. I've somehow been understood. My mistakes have been seen as just that, mistakes. And my intentions have not been willfully misinterpreted. It makes it much easier to aim for reconciliation, to say sorry, truly. Much easier to admit that I want to be better. Something unlocks. Something that was tight is loosened, that was anxious becomes calm. Something that was causing me to hold my breath to see if I could get away with it now breathes freely. There is a false kindness in the assurances of contemporary sermons which essentially say that being made in the image of God a fundamental Christian principle means that all we say and do is fine. Whatever you need, whatever feels right, you're just fine as you are. But there is a false strictness in the kind of sermon that fruitlessly and repetitively talks about sin and are begging for God's mercy and little else. Both this false kindness and false strictness are methods of avoiding a path to freedom that is rooted in our baptism promises and on offer in a life shaped by the mercy of God as revealed in the gospel from which we preach. The Jewish philosopher baptized towards the end of her too short life, Gillian Rose, wrote a powerful book, when she knew that she herself had not much longer to live. Love's work is a message from the front line of suffering and mercy, a message from the front line of living while dying. The quotation that she uses as part of the inspiration for her reflections is one from a 19th century Russian Orthodox monk, Siluan. It is breathtaking in its, in, in its simplicity and challenge. Siluan wrote, Keep your mind in hell and despair not. I'm suggesting that this is preaching for the 21st century. Honest preaching in the face of the huge and complex challenges that even in their honesty insist that despair is not an option. Despair is not an option. Because we preach a gospel of hope that is irreducible. Preaching that acknowledges there are many contemporary kinds of hell. But hell that has been harrowed by Christ in the act of divine mercy that was his death. And so... I am not lost there. I am, like the prodigal son, found there. And I then have ears to hear and a voice to preach the message from the God of mercy and truth. That whenever truth is preached, mercy is essential to enable a fragile humanity to hear the good news from which it has become so estranged. The opportunity in our generation for preachers is immense in this context because those who have ears to hear will hear. Thank you. <clears throat>
Lucy, thank you so much. What a day uh, it's been. Um, four very, very different speakers. And the time just goes so, so quickly. Uh, we do have 10 minutes before our final act of worship. I'm sure your hearts are full. I hope uh, your minds have been stimulated, that you've been inspired. Um, Lucy is with us to answer some questions. Um, if someone could walk around with a microphone, I can do that. Oh, Sam, you can do that. Thank you. This is just a response, Lucy, just to say a huge thank you for that very, for naming some of the difficult things we have to mm. watch on the news and then think, oh, heck, I've got to preach again mm. on Sunday. Mm. And that whole question of how we keep a balance with the hope we have in the gospel, but also with all that's going on. Then you described it so helpfully. Um, I don't really have... Any questions other than can you just can I ring you up for every <laughs> <laughs> once a week and just you know find out what you're preaching on? But thank you, yeah, thank you. Does anyone here find it easy to preach about judgment? <laughs> Do you ever preach about judgment? hard it's really hard uh, just a quick question to think I'm just wondering if prayers of intercession often make preaching harder because sometimes in prayers of intercession we pray about the powerful who are always outside the church they're politicians they're business leaders and yet there is almost a prophetic voice to our congregants about the power we have in how we spend our money and how we... And I'm thinking back to that context of two, three hundred years ago about with slave owners in the building. It was about what they did with their money and their possessions. Mm. And I just wonder whether prayers of intercession sometimes shift power outside of the sermon, and especially if they come after the sermon, when in the sermon you've tried to maybe bring, not judgment, but reflections on who is actually powerful in today's society, if that makes sense. That's a really good question. I mean, liturgically, confession comes before the sermon. Well, confession, then gospel, scripture, then the sermon reflects on scripture, and then the intercessions come after that. And I'm sure it's never happened to you, but I've certainly had intercessors correct my sermon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or correct what they thought, you know, I should have said. <laughs> Um, in intercession so um, I think that's a really interesting reflection I suppose just about power um, there's, a, gosh, there's a lot to say about this but I think that the New Testament it seems to, in my reading the New Testament has a much more positive attitude towards power than a lot of contemporary church uh, reflection spir spiritual teaching and, and indeed doctrine um, in the sense of saying that, and maybe maybe sometimes I think actually that can be a reflection of the um, the makeup of a congregation, so that there's a there's an there's a um, assumption that because we're already middle class, quite powerful, Church of England context I'm talking about, not all but sometimes, that the thing we have to do is to give our power away, and then the people who are really powerful because then it's morally better for us because we feel like we're being done to. And there's a, there's a sort of, um, I mean, I'm being really tough on us all, but, you know, let's, let's do it, um, that we can become a bit smug um, in, our, in our reinforcing of our powerlessness, whereas we're not that powerless. I individual people, we, ha we have agency. Whereas in the New Testament, there's a, there's, a, there's a different way of addressing power, human power, which is in a sense, of course you give it away, but you give it, you give it away, uh, I mean, cr there's the kenotic, you know, there's the kenotic uh, uh, movement 
um, power given away, but you give it in, away in order to become more to become more dignified yourself because you're made in the image of God and to use your power for good. So I think sometimes we do have a fantasy that's perpetuated in sermons and I find it in myself in churches where every, we're lobbying somebody who's not there. Whereas in fact God is with us and talking to God as if, you, as if God is somebody that you know means that you're immensely powerful as a community. So... Yeah, I, so I, I mean it's complex. It's complex, but I, I think that's I think that's a that's a good reflection that sometimes the the interplay between intercessions and sermon and I would say confession is that's that's quite complicated. Thank you. Last one. I mind a very general um, question, and not directed at you, Lucy, but just to the whole day of preachers, really. I'm wondering what you feel the role of humour is in sermons. Um, I'm not talking about slapstick jokes, but to rob yourself of a natural humour when you're preaching, feels to me, who has never preached, um, right at the start of things, to be quite a daunting prospect. And I just wondered whether there are any comments on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword because you can, as a preacher, of course, you know, again, having, having a fantasy about yourself that you're actually a really good stand-up comic and... You know, it's always got to start with a. It's got to start with a with a joke. That's that's clearly not great, um, but there's a playfulness about the gospel, I think, and there's a playfulness even in the most difficult of circumstances sometimes that's really important to embody. But all I would say to you is, don't force it. I mean, if you're naturally somebody who um, who finds things funny, then I think that's that's a really good thing to also be that person. In, in public, but sometimes, I mean, we, we all fall into this trap sometimes, don't we, where we think, I've got to entertain, otherwise they're not gonna hear what I'm gonna say. And um, we're not, we, we, are, we are there to be, you know, we, we're not really called to be boring if we can possibly manage it, but we're not there to be, to be stand-ups. So I definitely do use it, but I try, I, I sort of use it, I suppose, in, my, in, in normal life as well as sort of teasing um, and try and include myself. Good question. got a great urge to tell a joke now but I'm not going to. (laughs)